Hello, everyone, and welcome to an uh, episode number that I don't remember because I didn't look. Uh, I think it's 23 of Nutanix Weekly. Jarvis laughing at me because we always talk about this before we do it, and we didn't do it today. <laughs> well, um, we, got got uh, Jarvis Cox with me today, Nutanix SE extraordinaire. Jarvis, how's it going? Good, man. Happy, happy, happy Monday. Happy new week to you. Yeah, absolutely. Same to you. We You're right. 23. Also, good, good. Point. Oh, look at that. There you go. <laughs> why, why are you and I having to kick around what number of episode we're on here, Harvey? Because <laughs> uh, we have a special guest with us today, Mr. John Spallone, who is the newest ad- addition to Zintegra and one of the uh, sales engineers that we're adding to our staff. John, how's it going? Hey, it's going great. Great to be here. Looking forward to this today. Wonderful. Wonderful. Awesome. Welcome, John. Yeah. Thank you. Well, welcome to the team. Uh, this, this will be your first hazing. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is today your first day with Integra? Yes. Wow. Wow. Right yes. in the deep end. Oh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> we, we don't play over here, Jara. <laughs> uh, super cool. <laughs> ramp up. What ramp up? <laughs> Go. <laughs> He, he had all day. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah. We gave, we hey, gave him on. seven hours. Come on. Yeah, I know. Plenty of time. Plenty of time. That's amazing. Uh, John, tell, tell our audience about yourself. Well, uh, I come from a Citrix background. I've worked uh, in the field before with uh, consulting for many a year. Uh, moved over to Citrix and from there did a couple of odd jobs with some other partners and resellers out there and now i've joined the zentager team wonderful yeah I, I i mean i could really bore you with all the details but it's not worth it <laughs> Any, anybody who sees my name they'll, they'll know what's going on <laughs> like that schmuck's back oh great <laughs> <laughs> but we, we are happy to have you on board i'm happy uh, to be here I almost forgot to share my screen. I'm forgetting all my, my podcast etiquette here. I was going to remind you. Don't worry. Keep it straight. <laughs> we got you. We got you. So what are we talking about today, Harvey? We are talking about the blog called Seven Ways to Simplify Your Digital Workspace uh, Deployment in 2021 by Kevin Bacon, Anna Ruiz from Citrix, and John Williamson. It, it is always fun to me to see Kevin Bacon's name. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not that Kevin Bacon, but I always think, oh, wait, Kevin Bacon? I always have that, that momentary lapse of memory. Oh, oh. well, see, <laughs> I skipped that one, and I go straight to like, ooh, Bacon. <laughs> 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 so I thought you were taking that in a whole different direction. Well, I, I agree. It's always fun I, to see his name. I think any other name with Bacon would make me go, ooh, Bacon, but Kevin Bacon actually makes me think of Kevin Bacon. That's a good point. Um, That's a good point. <laughs> Uh, yeah, see, I, I told you, John, fast and loose. <laughs> Best way. So um, jumping into it a little bit, you know, the first paragraph, the intro talks about how the modern workplace has changed dramatically since COVID-19. And uh, we've got everybody trying to adopt a digital workspace solution uh, to try to make sure that, I mean, at, at a basic level, to try to make sure everybody can still work, right? Um, we, we've, we've had lots of these conversations. We've had lots of, uh, you know, uh, COVID has affected us now and now we need to go from zero to hero very quickly so that people can work from home. Okay, well, what do you have in place so that they can work from home? Uh, VPN, okay, is, is that it? Yes. Wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like that was part of the, sort of the first round, right? Of the panicky, yeah. like, whoa, like get something stood up real fast. And it was like, yeah. <laughs> send people home with whatever they've got, you know, and maybe VPN back in for sure. Well, look, it, you know, everybody had a, a different strategy to this. And I, I think a lot of it had to do with how long they thought things were going, going to go on, uh, but also how much, you know, the business was willing to spend. And for some people, the business was only willing to spend for a temporary solution, uh, which has now become much more permanent. <laughs> right, and I think that's I think that keeps us timely here. You know, we're we're not at the beginning anymore, right? But I think what what we're maybe on the or in the early phases of of the second section is 
is permanent work from home, right? What was a reasonably long band-aid is turning right. into, hey, you know, we're 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 shifting to now permanent work from home for maybe all roles, right? And how does that change the landscape of your environment? Right. Which yeah. is, you know, that's that's a much, much different conversation, right? Because where people were willing to take chances and, you know, do just just enough or just good enough, you know, now they want people to be more productive and actually have something in place that is more permanent, uh, more all-encompassing solution. And, uh, you know, more so one that they want to design around uh, including and not, you know, just a, an afterthought of here's how we can get people in. Right. Yeah. Because yeah, there's, there's a lot of, there's so much low hanging fruit, right. That, that the, the first solution, um, could still yield, right. If, if you just send people home with, with workstations and VPN connections, <clears throat> there's so many more benefits you could be taking advantage of. <clears throat> that a, that a digital workspace right could could still offer you right and it's still worth putting that on your on your roadmap of like when do we actually make the shift into sort of doing this the right way and right. staying in, in, a, in a newer model right right I, I mean I, I think that's a very important piece too a very important thing you just hit on is you know at the beginning it was very much let's just do this fast and quickly and make sure we can get people in and and now there's a much bigger focus on okay, let's, let's try to come back around and do this right. Or, you know, as, as you have uh, people who have, you know, hardware expiring or, you know, things like that that are coming up, licensing agreements that are coming up, uh, there, there is a much bigger use case and a much bigger reason to actually, you know, design and architect and make these things happen the right way instead of the fast way. I think that that's one of the things that uh, we can talk through that I know this is addressing too. Uh, you know, they, they hit on digital workspaces not being a new idea, but deployment and operational complexity kept organizations from realizing the benefits that these offer. And, you know, we're, we talk about that all the time, right? We, you know, the, the people at Zintegra, it's like when the pandemic hit, you know, everybody was started started working from home overall, and you know, these Integra people, they're, they're, you know, where people are asking us, "Well, how are you guys working from home so quickly?" And we're, well, we were always doing this. Like this is always how we've done it. We know nothing different than the strategy of being able to work from anywhere. Yeah. And for the organizations that we work with and have been working with for years who know nothing but being able to work from anywhere. This was another day, you know, another day at work. <laughs> well, yeah, I yeah. mean, you, you take a look at for years, you know, we've always talked about building for that pandemic. And, you know, to some of us, it was just a word. And we finally got what that means recently. And how does that infrastructure handle for this moving forward? And like you said, you know, some people were ready for it. Some people weren't. Some people just didn't envision all the benefits they could with a consolidated solution, a multi-point solution, whether it's a traditional blend or on-prem cloud-based, but, you know, really starting to bring all that together. Now they have that time to sit back and look and say, what's going to work for us going forward? Because we've already hit those speed bumps at the beginning. Yeah, they, I think we've all worked with, worked with those customers that had, you know, the the large bunkers full of like empty cubicles that was yeah. for like business continuity, just in case, right? And and all of a sudden it's like, now every company needs that all at once. Oh, and by the way, you can't put everybody in one room together. You know, yeah. it's, a, it's a very different reimagining of the scenario. Yeah. Um, I like the way this, this one paragraph lays out sort of the the hallmarks of the aspirations, right? Simple, secure, and performant. Right, performant. That's that's more for the employees. Secure. That's more for the company. Simple. That's parts for both. Right, because we want right. we have to have something that's simple for both. Yeah. The folks that have to manage it day to day, and the folks that want to use it and connect to it. And I think it's I think I think it's interesting to think about um, as we live in a world and look at the headlines where employees 
sort of have more and more leverage every day in their relationship with their employer and there's more portability in the workforce and people willing to to change jobs <clears throat> to get yeah. a better work from home balance work life balance remote work capabilities that that really means that the the methodology the framework that you use to offer your employees work from home becomes a potentially competitive advantage or disadvantage right Absolutely. sort of neglect it at your peril right yeah. like if Absolutely. your employee is sitting there at home all day going, well, this blah, 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 remote desktop is so darn slow. Like that's one of a thousand cuts, right. That could contribute to now you have to go, you know, hire a replacement and get them trained and operational. And a lot of things you'd rather probably not have to go through. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I mean, you know, we, we see all the time in, in the news today that the labor market is tight is, is, you know, it is in high demand. And, uh, you know, when you have, when you have the ability at work to use systems and, you know, use systems, use software and things that just work and just give you that, that pleasurable experience of making the technology disappear and you just go in and you do what you do every day and, you know, you leave at the end of the day or whatever it is, right, that is much, much more satisfying than banging your head against the screen or the keyboard all day because things are running slow or you're having issues or things like that. You know, that's more help desk tickets, that's more user feedback, and it really is just more user frustration, right? From mm -hmm. a business standpoint, if you can make it very frictionless for the user to use technology, then they can spend their time on being productive. And the more time that they're spending on, you know, opening help desk tickets and being frustrated with the system and, and even worse for, you know, for the whole secure concept, working their way around what you've put in place for them, <laughs> because they will. They always um, do. That, that is all time spent that is not making the business money. They're, they're not being productive for the business. So, Ultimately, you know, the, the business becomes its own worst enemy when they don't have systems that are performing well. So these, um, we're not just thinking broad thoughts around digital workspace, right? Are we like this blog post calls out some specific recommendations, right? Like what goes in the stack, we think, to offer something right. that is that simple, performant, and secure environment for, for employees, right? Yeah, so they, they go into being able to utilize uh, Citrix and Citrix Cloud on top of Nutanix uh, for, your, for your technology stack to help basically build exactly what we're talking about. The, the, a good example of a, a work environment that will allow you to work from anywhere and work on top of a platform that will allow for you to be hosted anywhere. Uh, to help make it so that you can be, you know, resilient, secure, and have the performance you need in order to keep your users from being frustrated and work their way around your systems that you put in place. Um, we, you know, they talk in the article about being able to uh, resolve issues in minutes instead of days and being able to guarantee to the business the same linear costs when you scale from 500 to 50,000 users is the, the example that they have in here. Um, yeah, but, right. The yeah. core benefit of HCI in general, right, with, especially with Nutanix, is that sort of linear growth, like cost per whatever, right? For, even for servers, cost per CPU, cost per gig right. of memory and storage. But um, that whole concept really cut its teeth, right, on, on end user VDI because... <clears throat> that's where we see the most the identical workloads, right? We have a thousand desktops, 3000 right. desktops that are all the same vCPU, same memory. Um, and so that ability to scale, right? Gives the business the confidence of, I know what the future looks like for cost modeling. If I grow, if I shrink, if I scale out, if I need a DR site, uh, that predictability, right? Is, is kind of uh, worth its own weight, if, as they say. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, one, of, one of the other things that hit on in, in our blog post here is that you've, you've got the ability to reduce your CapEx and OpEx uh, by using Citrix on, on Nutanix. Uh, they, they save by approximately 164%. Um, 
I don't know every detail of how they got that number, but they do link uh, for more information into the, the, the source of those numbers. But uh, you know that, that turns around to the solution being able to pay for itself in as little as six months is what they're quoting here in the article. Um, we, we have, again, we, we have these types of you know, conversations all the time and we talk through uh, you know, the return on investment that, that people can get. We talk about you know, justifying the cost uh, and we talk about doing that in, in a bunch of different ways, right? We, it's not just you know, looking at Nutanix versus three tier or you know, Citrix versus uh, remote desktop services or something like that. You know, being able to, again, build out the systems the way you need to build them and spending the company's money wisely still definitely means being able to get to the other side where you can promise those things that we're talking about, being able to be secure, being able to have some simple administration, uh, simple simplicity for the user to use it, and then have the performance that they're looking for. And I mean, things like that, those, those unseen, unwritten costs uh, also help justify and pay for themselves too. And, you know, in less personnel, less stress, less help desk, you know, less maintenance, all of those things. Well, and I'll have to go uh, take a deeper look into that specific um, sort of like ROI study that they linked to because I, th I believe it shows that the positive ROI, even just against like say, say three tier, right, as a platform for right. virtual desktops, which in my opinion, of course, I'm super biased here. That's almost sort of like a easy mode, right? Like, of course, you're going to have better, <laughs> better ROI on, on any HCI platform than you would on, on three tier. That makes sense. Uh, what I'll have to look into, if it doesn't cover it, then it would be maybe categorized more as, as a soft cost or soft benefit. Right. Is stuff like, but how do I even have my team administer, right? Like there's, there's a night and day experience difference between go patch a thousand endpoints over VPN connections versus... Right you know, go patch a thousand virtual desktops that are in the data center, um, you know, that I can have backups of more cleanly that I can recover from that when someone spills, you know, coffee on their laptop, I have a very, very different kind of conversation about recovery um, versus, versus that physical desktop, you know, on their desk at home. Absolutely. So if, if that's not factored in and it could be plausibly a soft cost because we offer every customer, you know, a, a, a tailored ROI study, uh, TCO study on like, what are you comparing us to, and you know what are the what are the differentiators? Because um, we want you to, we want to use it, use your get your real numbers right. You, we know that our numbers or broad numbers are not as meaningful as a customer's specific numbers that, that are more meaningful to them. Right. Um, so whether it's a, an on paper hard savings or a or a soft cost benefit from that kind of uh, administrative operational efficiency, right? It's 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 certainly there either way. Yeah, and, and the link that they have out there uh, takes you to a, a Forrester total economic impact study. So uh, as, as we all know, Forrester is one of the very respected names and being able to put things like this together and also, uh, you know, IT software, hardware vendor ranking. So uh, a, a very, uh, very commonly respected name out there to, to make sure that you're seeing that the numbers that are going behind this aren't just thrown up to the ceiling and you know, we hope they came back and oh we just picked 164 percent right it, yeah. that's not a random number and you can see the math behind it and it is fully justified so no for sure and like i said every customer is entitled to get their own like we love to help customers understand the value there, right. but there are the ones like that that are representative also are are great as well to show like broadly what do we see across the industry and across our customer base. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. One of the uh, key points too that you were bringing up about is the performance for their customer, the end user's experience. If you go into the graphic a little bit more, that highlights exactly what we're talking about. Instead of that end user connecting back to their core data center and accessing application access or whatever, the flexibility that we're giving here in this type of solution is the multiple resource locations in the back end, whether it be cloud, whether it be whatever cloud provider that's out there, their own on-prem data center providing some of those services by leveraging that multi-homed infrastructure for the user, you can actually move those services now closer to the user within those regions 
to get that better response and what you would get just going straight VPN into a data center. Absolutely, Absolutely right. Because isn't that, isn't that with that, let me, let me get a coherent sentence out here, with that focus <laughs> on like high end user experience quality, right? Doesn't it, that gets harder to achieve if you try to lock into traditional thinking of this is my one data center for like continental US, right? Everyone connects to it there. If, I, if you live in Nebraska, great. Maybe you get a great experience. And if you live on either coast, right? You The, the laws of physics will simply drag your electrons yes. farther over the wire. Whereas if I can leverage stuff intelligently like, like you know, public cloud, like, you know, private data centers and, and that administration stays easy as I have a fabric of, of connectivity for my end users to, to come into, I can keep everyone's experience higher more of the time and not go, not go insane trying to manage it all myself. Correct. Yeah, that's, that's, that's one of the key benefits about this type of marriage with cloud leveraged in there is to be able to disperse those resources for those users closer to their proximity for those response times and then giving you the ability to burst. You're not relying on your own data center hardware. You have the leverage of cloud to be able to burst for whatever reasons, you know, you know, tomorrow we have a snowstorm and we've got, you know, an entire office out. Now we can burst up to support them being able to work completely from home as well. I mean, night and day, night and day difference for the, the organizational security boundary too, right? I mean, if, if there's simply no way anyone plugs a thumb drive into any corporate asset because I don't allow USB over my, my, my desktop connections, that's just such a, a radically different type of, of mitigation, right? Versus just like, oh, we hope we've disabled all the USB ports appropriately, right? Or Absolutely. put in middleware to try to encrypt, you know, things that get written to USB drives. Yeah, you, um, you, you hit on something very important there too, right? The, the whole science of guessing or hoping goes away because things are set by policy and they are right. definite. It, it is either yes or no, right? It's on or off. Um, and of course, you can you can maintain those and you can change them by user or by group or however you need to do it within the within the uh, the business to maintain your security posture. But you have the ability to just shut it all down, right, and make sure that nobody is doing any of it. And you know that that's how it is because that's how it sits. It is a zero or a one. <laughs> yeah, and, and without without really impacting productivity, right? Right. In the office, right? In the high rise, yeah, maybe more so in the past, but still today, like you'd see some thumb drive usage and you'd hear complaints if you turned them off. With a remote workforce, who are you gonna pass that thumb drive to in the first place, right? So you're right. actually increasing security. There actually really is basically no trade-off from a ease of use or customer experience, your, your end user experience. Um, and the security team loves you, right? Like it's literally a win-win-win. So yeah, if that, like if that kind of thing isn't in your TCO analysis, whether you consider it a software hard benefit, right? Like the software to disable USB has a cost. The rollout to deploy it and support it long term has a cost, and and you know that's another another competitive advantage that a, a virtual desktop uh, digital workspace approach would offer. And the other thing that security loves too is the fact that you know, like you had mentioned, multiple laptops going home with the users or resources going home with them. Security now has to manage all those devices. Be aware of those make sure that they're tracking everything on it. Now, when we're talking from a virtual desktop standpoint, it's one secure image distributed out to many. So it, it makes that overlook from security when they're getting into it, it's easier for both the security team to handle and also the administrators to deploy it out and know they're deploying a sound solution and a secure solution to the end users. Yeah, absolutely. I, I used to liken that to would you like to stick armed forces in every bank in America or would you like to protect just one Fort Knox? Yeah. And of course the easy answer is, well, I'll just protect one thing instead of a million. <laughs> and it's, it's the same concept, right? You, you have all your information in your data center, you protect your data center and you give people only the access they need back into the things that they need at the data center. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is very much that same type of scenario. So. If security can spend all of their time protecting Fort Knox, then you know what happens at the banks outside in the, the rest of the US becomes not, not inconsequential, but less consequential. 
So uh, it can't hurt you as bad if something happens to one of those locations or one of those endpoints, um, as long as you're protecting the data and protecting access to it, I mean, you could easily just kill access for a user or for a device uh, that has gone rogue in some way, gotten lost or something like that, uh, rather than have to worry about what can actually happen as a result of that. So Harvey, I think, Harvey, I think this brings us to the end of uh, this article, but should we give a teaser of like what's probably to come as we go through the series here? Sure. So uh, the, the next article in this series is how to simplify the Citrix virtual application and desktop control plane, uh, which I'm sure uh, I, I have that conversation more times a week than I can count. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, it'll be a good blog post to, to talk through. Um, we also have another one. I know uh, blog post three is out to how to simplify digital workspace solution, virtualization, and file services. Uh, that would be a good one to hit on too. We talk about uh, file shares and Nutanix files a lot. So definitely, uh, definitely another good topic uh, to talk through when we get to that one. Uh, and they, they actually have four more, how to simplify digital workspace security, how to simplify reporting analysis and issue remediation, how to simplify un, uh, unified workspace, and how to simplify business continuity and hybrid cloud. And uh, all of those topics can very much be addressed by uh, the combination of Nutanix and Citrix. And uh, they'll hit on uh, that in each of these blog posts that we have coming. So uh, lot, lots more to come. Uh, this, this was you know, noted that it's inspired by a joint presentation that came from the Global Next Digital Experience, or dot .next, excuse me, digital experience. And that's uh, Nutanix's conference that they have each year uh, to help you know, spread the word on Nutanix, but also give people some, some additional training uh, and additional opportunities to learn more about the technology and how they can help integrate it. Which we should, yeah, probably give a, a teaser for for um, for this year's dot next coming That's September twentieth right. through the twenty third, right? Month. That's right. Oh. <laughs> Segway September twentieth to twenty third. Uh, Nutanix dot com slash next uh, online again this year. Um, so of course attend uh, on your schedule and at no cost. So Nutanix dot right. com slash next there. And Harvey, anything you want to you want to plug? Uh, sure. So I I actually have a class workshop coming up, a uh, hands-on workshop on Friday, uh, which is the Friday the 13th. Look at that, Friday, August 13th. Uh, so you guys can still sign up for via the website and uh, we would love to see you there. We'll get to talk more uh, about some of the concepts we talked about today, but also be able to put your hands on, you know, the, the equipment, the, uh, well, not the equipment since it's virtual, but you put your hands on the, the consoles and be able to actually do things to the, the real physical equipment that you just won't be able to see. Uh, but everything else will be you know, done in the lab. Everything else will be real, real time. Uh, so you'll be able to go through that, uh, ask questions and learn and all of those good things. Uh, so again, Friday the 13th, uh, you can sign up for it on our website and the cost to you is absolutely zero, just some time. Very cool. Yep. Uh, Jairus, closing remarks. <laughs> Been a pleasure. John, thanks for being able to join us today, man. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, definitely looking forward to the uh, carry on of the conversation here with these other topics. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely, uh, you're, you're definitely invited for more. Oh, thank love you. love for you to, to come <laughs> back and share some more of your knowledge. It's, that's why we're here. Sure. Uh, that is all that I have for today, too. So uh, we definitely appreciate you guys listening. And uh, I guess with that, we'll sign off for the day. Cool. Talk to you all later. All right. Thanks a lot.